uh, unfortunately, Andrew Jenkins was unable to make it at the last minute, and we apologize to people who thought that they were tuning into a talk by Andrew Jenkins this evening, but we did send out an emergency newsletter. It's also on the Facebook page for Cape Bird Club, so we should um, have got to most people, and I have answered some emails as well that I received. But it's wonderful to have Mike because he stepped into the breach and he said, well, I've just had the most wonderful trip to Limpopo province. Let me share that with um, our members. And Mike Buckham is no stranger to us. Those in the Cape Bird Club know that he's serving on the committee, that he's our usual Zoom master. And he's done numerous talks already about his travels, which are fairly considerable, both overseas and in Southern Africa. He started birding at six years old, and he's a wonderful bird photographer. He's very keen on passing his skills on, and many of you have already watched the Better Birding seminars that he co-hosts and found out how wonderful he is as a teacher he is a very talented teacher so talented speaker talented teacher talented photographer and he actually is wonderful at enthusing so many people about birding he's passed on that enthusiasm to his children and especially to adam and adam is becoming a really good birder as well. He has his own web page. It's called Buckham Birding, and you can look at that as well. It's got several sections to it and is well worth reading. So, Mike, without much ado, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm going to, you are already have share screening and I'm going, you are unmuted. And again, just before Mike begins, please can you remember to turn off your microphones and your videos? Right, Mike, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Priscilla. Right. Thanks very over much to for. You. Thank you. Um, you can Mike. you maybe um, unmute yourself? There's a little bit of feedback, yes. so it might, I'm going uh, it might to make mute it a little myself bit. now. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and uh, talking to the club again. Priscilla, thank you very much for the um, the overly stated introduction. A um, lot of uh, exaggeration there, but it's always nice to um, present to the club. Sorry, someone has just unmuted. If they can mute again, there we go. Better. Um, yeah, as uh, Priscilla said, I'm in Joburg. Um, the plan was to be back in Cape Town by this evening, um, but uh, the weather here is great and we decided to extend our stay. Um, we spent the Easter weekend um, in the Drakensberg, which is somewhere I haven't been for a long time, and we had some wonderful birding there as well. Um, I'm not sure we had quite enough birding to do another talk, um, but uh, it was a great place to be to spend a couple of days and to see some amazing endemics like Buff Street Chat and uh, Bush Black Cap. Um, lots of Cape vultures, unfortunately no Lamachaya this time around. So anyway, um, I am doing a talk this evening on um, our trip um, with a couple of mates to the Limpopo province. We, we did cross um, through and into a, a, a number of provinces, which included Gauteng and the Northwest, and um, I think even um, um, Mpumalanga, but uh, the bulk of the trip was, was in the um, areas around Limpopo. Um, and um, I'll explain why we went there in, in just a short while, but this is a, a, a photo taken on a, a beautiful misty morning at Nelsflay Nature Reserve, which is, I think, one of the underrated uh, gems uh, within our country and, and really worth a visit. So we'll come to that in a sec. So off we go. Um, so our itinerary was essentially um, centered around um, the area to the northeast of uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg. Um, what we did is we, we um, looked at a, a possible area to, to get as many species as we possibly could and, and also to focus on quite a few endemics. I'm being served a wonderful 
um, chocolate milkshake because it's quite warm upstairs. So you'll excuse me as I sip my chocolate milkshake. Um, so we um, we we spent a little bit of time in the the eastern um, grass the grasslands uh, high altitude grasslands east of Johannesburg, um, and we visited some places that you'd never have expected. We went to a wonderful restaurant in Bronkhorst, and who knew that those existed? Um, we then uh, crossed over to the floodplains and thornfelt of Zarkeldrift Road. Um, we then went north to the Nell River floodplain um, and followed on by going to Polokwane. And um, those that don't know the Polokwane Game Reserve or Polokwane Nature Reserve is a, a wonderful birding spot with a very specific endemic that we, we went to see. Um, and then we finished off our trip in the, the, the mist belts and the Afromontane forests of Mahubas Kloof. Um, and down in the subtropical um, areas around Zanin, you drop down from probably 1,200 meters, I guess, down to about 500 meters where um, the bush gets a bit lusher and a little bit warmer and there's a whole suite of species we could add to our lists over there. So the question is, um, well, before I go on to why we did this trip, um, I just did a little exercise of overlaying um, my bird lasser trip um, points onto, onto the map that we followed. And you can see how those areas are, are highlighted in, in, in the, the ones that we visited. So um, it's quite clear where the species um, concentrations were. All right, so one of the um, very important things that one does when doing a trip like this is to prepare. Um, and I will say that um, some of the members in our group were better prepared than others. Um, I gave specific instructions for everyone to read through all the trip reports and these books, Bird in Gauteng and the Bird Finder. And I was uh, very disappointed um, at the lack of preparation from some members. Um, and we'll probably get on to that in a second. So why would one do this trip and why would we do it now? So there were a few reasons. Um, I, I think most people will be aware that that area is, is a very diverse uh, birding spot. Um, so the first question is why not? Why, why not spend a couple of days um, up in those areas and why not go birding with good mates? Um, it's a very well-known area for late summer migrants. They're vocal and, and active in the Thornfelt. And um, one of the um, species groups that we were really hoping to concentrate on were the um, migrant Palearctic warblers, um, olive tree warbler, garden warbler, marsh warbler, river warbler, great reed warbler, um, missing a couple, common white throat, thrush nightingale, which is actually specifically not a warbler, but um, falls into the similar kind of group. Um, and what you'll notice in this presentation is there are no photos of any of those species. In fact, not one photo of one of those birds. And we really battled with them. I I'm not quite sure why. Um, we found uh, marsh warblers were everywhere, but they're tricky to photograph. We had a few common white throats. Um, also very, very difficult to photograph. We, we heard one great reed warbler and it was a, a very stilted song. We heard no olive tree warblers, not a single olive tree warbler. And, and I think it may just be my lack of uh, skill. Um, I'd uh, thought I'd picked up that call by uh, learning it. Um, I was one of the people that did the preparation. So I prepared uh, the calls, but we didn't get olive tree warbler um, and lots of willow warblers, but we missed thrush nightingale and, and river warblers were actually not yet vocal. They tend to start singing towards the end of March before they depart. And anyone who knows um, river warblers, even when you hear it, it's a hell of a thing to try and see. So um, there were plenty of other late summer migrants and this European bee eater is a good example of that. Lots of uh, wonderful color, colorful uh, migrants such as this bee eater and, and things like European roller and blue cheek beater for that matter. So um, another reason we went to that part of the world was um, because of Cyclone Eloise and our, our original plan um, sort of towards the end of last year was to um, head into KZN and, and focus on on the Zululand area, um, taking a couple of days off and getting our necessary pink slips from our, our respective wives and families. Um, but in February, Cyclone Eloise hit um, and with the bizarre sightings of um, sooty terns all over the place and frigate birds inland, um, there was just a deluge of water and those areas northeast of Johannesburg, so Sarkel Drift and Ellsflake particularly, just get inundated with uh, water and those floodplains um, flood and it brings in a huge number of bird species that, that take advantage of those conditions and they breed. And I just said to my mates, um, I think it's a good opportunity. This, this only happens potentially once in every 10 years and uh, let's do this and we can always do KZN and, uh, at another stage. So, I mean, that's just a, a very quick pick of um, the Nailsflay floodplain and um, that uh, flooded grass at Vogelfontein Hyde is just 
full of lesser moorhens. You can't see any of them here. We battled with Allen's Gallinule. We couldn't find any of those, but we got African Crake um, and plenty of water birds breeding, lots of um, waterfowl, so whiteback ducks and fulvous ducks and whiteface ducks. Um, so very, very opportune conditions to, to take them advantage of, of uh, the wonderful rains that those areas had. So the, the next reason was our COVID-19 trough. Um, so one of my uh, tour party was um, a good mate of mine who's an actuary and he had us uh, looking at COVID-19 graphs all the time. And um, what we noticed is that the numbers were declining perfectly to coincide with our, our trip. I think we'd had, I mean, uh, Lombi will tell us exactly how many days, but we'd had, let's say 30 or 40 days in a row of declining cases. And uh, when we first started talking about this trip, it was as the second wave was accelerating, we put it on us. But um, as uh, the numbers declined, we set our date and we, we took a, a gap um, in the trough. And, and that was um, probably the safest and most sensible thing to do and um, all worked out well in the end. And um, we needed something different to the fanboss we've seen for over 12 months. I, I think um, I've seen more fanboss and Western Cape birds than you can shake a stick at um, over the last 12 months. I, I don't uh, dispute that we have some of the most wonderful endemics in our um, fanboss areas, um, but I, I needed to see something different. I needed to see some bushfowl birds. I needed to see some wetland birds and I just needed to, to do some, some different birding to the, the birding I'd done for the last 12 months. I did the, the wider Cape Town challenge last year. And um, I think if I have to visit Strandfontein again um, in the near future, it may be too much, but uh, we are very blessed with what we have, um, but it was time for a change. And um, it was a great way to spend time with, with good mates. Um, and, you know, with COVID, we've, we've all been pretty restricted and we, we don't see of, as much of each other as we used to. Um, and um, I decided that uh, um, these three friends of mine were the right people to, to go with. And um, I, I will introduce them to you now. So who was our touring party? Um, and um, our first uh, participant was uh, Dean Gramps uh, Borsoff. And so um, Dean is the youngest ever retiree from Old Mutual. Um, I think he um, has planned for about 70 years of retirement. And so what was, does one do when you're retired and um, not working? Um, you become a birder. And um, no one is more fanatical about his newfound hobby than, than is Dean. Um, he is hitting it very hard and his, um, his trajectory as a birder has been um, astronomical. So um, he lives in Grayton and he's a top five finisher in the Cape Town Wider Challenge of 2020. And you just have to, I mean, those of the, the Cape Bird Club, you guys all know most of those names. And if you look at um, the company in which Dean is keeping himself um, over 2020, you can see how much he's, he's learned as a birder over the last um, sort of two or three years. So his skill sets uh, include unbridled drive to see as, as many birds as possible. Um, and you can see him uh, traipsing through some very long grass. And that was a, a photo I took of Dean in, in KZN. We, we did a, a very uh, sneaky uh, trip. My son, Adam, Dean and I went to KZN for two days, if you can believe it. It was just to see some more birds, just uh, really taking advantage of, of a little gap in the calendar. Um, so he, he wants to see as many birds as he possibly can. And he's got the birding intensity of a veteran, not in age, but just in, in birding intensity. And he, he is um, one of the best at, at spotting birds um, around him. His lifeless pre-tour was on 531, and we'll revisit that. So the next um, participant was a very long-standing old mate of mine, Mark, the dog Naughty. I don't even know where the dog comes from, but um, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He specializes in knees and hips. So um, if anyone wants his business card, um, I'll make it available after the presentation. So just pop me a message and I can send it to you. Um, that's his much more official um, photograph. He looks quite um, quite intimidating, but um, he is one of the best knee and hip surgeons around. Um, he's also a fanatical new birder. He's been birding with me for about three or four years. And um, the great thing about Norch is that he's he's doing it with his, his two daughters and his wife. So there's um, his older daughter, Shella, um, and um, she is a, a very fanatical birder. And uh, Tana on the right, she is um, equally as fanatical. She probably has a shorter attention span just because she's um, still very little. And this photograph on the right is a classic. Um, if you guys can recognize, I don't know what the quality of the photo is like, but that's John Graham in the background. And it just so happened that Mark was there with Shella and Tana, the, the moment, literally the moment that John um, found the bed sandpiper, which I think everybody in the club has 
taken advantage of and is going to have a look for. So um, Mark was standing right next to John with his two daughters um, when John discovered the bed sandpipe. And I think that's a great story. So um, his skill set includes coffee and beer snobbery. Um, he's a good swimmer. He's a great paddler. And he does quite a bit of mountain biking. And um, that was him and I doing the Sani to Sea race about uh, 10 years ago when I was a lot skinnier. Um, but none of those skills were actually useful for bird tour. Um, he did keep our beers cold. That was his main task. We made sure that the, the cooler box was given to him every day and he kept our beers cold. So his life list was on 558 and that was also a, a pre-tour number. But he is actually most famous for his guns. And um, it's, quite, um, it's quite something when we're on a ride together and he pulls out his biceps, which he calls his guns, or he sometimes refers to them as thunder and lightning. And you can see he has no um, qualms about pulling them out at any moment in time. And apologies to all of those that um, wonder why I'm making fun of him. And then we have um, our final participant, well, um, next to me, um, Paul Lombie Lewis. I'm not gonna go into the nickname Lombie, that was a very long story, but he's, he was the driver and he, the self-appointed chief executive officer of our bird tour. Um, he's an actuary and co-founder of the Peak Child Schools. And there he looks very respectable um, as his uh, executive director of Peak Child Schools. And he's um, um, shaping the lives of many young children in the, the wonderful schools that he heads up. Um, and there is um, a photo of him in a slightly less, um, I think, official capacity. That was um, Paul climbing over a fence um, in the grasslands um, east of Johannesburg and um, he was going to help us flush a um, short-tailed pipit. Um, and the great thing about that photo is it captures the moment when his pants got caught on a barbed wire fence and he, he ended up uh, ripping them. So um, that's another photo of Paul. And that's generally what he does when he's birding with us is he doesn't really know where he's going. Um, so he, his skill set is limited. He's got weak eyes, poor hearing, and he has a, a severe lack of birding knowledge. He has a life list of 665 pre-tour. And he's well known in birding circles for having the highest ratio of SA birds relative to his birding skill. There's no one in South Africa who's seen so many birds with as little skill as Paul does. Um, and one of the things that frustrated me is he has the worst birding attire. And uh, he wore that um, lime green shirt on numerous occasions on the tour, uh, mostly in the forest where forest birding requires um, stealth and quietness and blending in with the sort of surroundings. And Paul would join us with that lime green shirt. And we saw very little in the forests, unfortunately. And then the, the final member of the tour was uh, myself and that's um, me and my son, Adam. Um, so you don't really need to know who I am, um, but I have a waning skill set, and I have deteriorating eyes, ears and um, muscular tone. And that's why I generally go birding with Adam because he has um, all three of those um, skill sets um, in abundance and he helps me find the birds that I can't find anymore. Um, and I'm also prone to an incredibly poor diet choices while on bird, bird tour. So this was literally five minutes after we um, picked up the car and left the airport heading for some grasslands to do some birding. Um, and this photo was taken specifically to send to my wife to show her that I was going to be eating chocolate for five days. All right, so let's get on to the um, slightly more formal stuff and um, so you, show you some uh, bird pictures. So um, I think um, I was called in to do this talk at, uh, at, at the last minute, as Priscilla said, and I, I love sharing my experiences as a birder. Um, I guess some people may find this particular topic not as exciting as, say, Uganda or Peru, um, but we have some wonderful birds and I've um, hopefully taken some decent photographs. I'm not going to show a million photographs, but I'm going to show you some of the photographs of, of birds that I thought were really special and some of the photos that I thought were special. So this is um, near the Broncos um, Sprite uh, Dam Nature Reserve. Um, so I'm just going to close the window. There's quite a lot of noise outside. My family is enjoying a very nice dinner outside in the beautiful weather. So apologies if that noise has been a bit frustrating. Um, so this was um, taken at sunset and we had some marsh owls flying around us, which was a nice bird to see. Um, and we, we started the next morning um, in the grasslands north of uh, Bronco Sprite. And it's, it's a, a set of um, roots that are described in Fancy and Etienne's book called the Flaklachte um, Grasslands. And um, I chose the most boring and most common bird to show you as a photograph to start with. That's a zitting cysticula. And there is an abundance of those uh, amongst a, a whole bunch of other cysticulas. So that's what the grasslands look like. We had beautiful weather. There's Lomby just after he managed to get over the fence. Um, and here are some of the birds. And this particular bird was the one we were looking for. 
Um, and at this time of year, unfortunately, these birds are, are not at all vocal and, and they do not display. Melodious lark is an endemic um, and one of our very localized endemic and, and quite um, sort of vulnerable because of the, the habitat it chooses. It, it chooses these grasslands and a lot of that's been turned to cultivation. Um, and so it's a tough bird to find and it was only the second time I'd ever seen one, um, but we really battled to find them because they are silent and you've got to, you've got to just go on a bit of luck. So we had this bird sitting on a little um, termite mound and then I was lucky enough to capture this one um, as it uh, flew past me, unfortunately not in its display. Those that know Melodious Lark will know that um, a nice challenge to set yourself is to um, try and identify all the bird calls that it is mimicking when it uh, displays. And I've heard uh, figures of 25 to 30 species that it mimics while it's displaying in the in the air above the grasslands. So that's a September, October thing, or maybe November. Um, we had uh, no such um, luck with it in, in uh, during our time there. And then just some more um, beautiful birds, um, all brown. One would expect them to be brown in the grasslands. Banded Martin, this is a young bird. You can see its fleshy gape. Um, we had quite a lot of difficulty with some of the larks. Um, this was a youngish uh, rufous nape lark that gave us a little bit of a, a go. We thought it uh, might be something more exciting until it perched onto that, um, that log. It's a, probably the most common lark in those grassland areas. And um, then greater kestrel. We don't see greater kestrel that often in, in the Cape. Um, you can see them up in the Tanqua quite far north, um, but they are quite common around those grassland areas. And this one um, was doing exactly what all greater kestrel do. And they sit on top of electricity pylons and never ever make for decent uh, photographs. And then um, a nice uh, a greater striped swallow. And I just uh, I enjoyed this photo. The background is quite nice and it's a, it's a beautiful looking bird when you get up so nice and close to it. And then um, SA Cliff Swallow was an interesting one. It's a bird that I've seen so few times in my life. It's, a, it's really a, um, a bird that we don't get um, that close to Cape Town. There are uh, birds uh, somewhere in the, uh, in the, on the N1 um, as you go through Three Sisters, but um, it's quite phenomenal how common they are. Um, and we've, we've, I've seen plenty of them on the trip to the Drakensberg now. We saw literally hundreds of SA Cliff Swallows and they are funny looking birds. They, they look a little bit scruffy. Um, they look like a scruffy young barn swallow. Um, but when you see them in flight, um, they've got that square ended tail. Um, unlike a barn swallow, which has a, a notch in its tail. And um, it's got a very distinctive um, pale um, sort of uh, tan rump. And so as soon as you see a bird that looks like a young barn swallow and it banks away from you with that square tail and that um, pale rump, you know that you're onto an SA cliff swallow and they, they love um, hanging around, um, you know, sort of culverts and bridges um, over little water, uh, water courses. Right, so, once we were done with the grasslands, and the grasslands were really just an introduction to some, some birds and maybe just to increase the species count, and we really went there specifically for a melodious lark, I guess, and, and we got things like white-bellied corhorn, or white-bellied bustard, um, and a few other nice endemic birds, but uh, it really was the, the entree for um, what was the, the, the main course of our trip, which was the floodplains and thornfelt of, of Zarkel Drift Road, and then further north into Nailsflay. So that's a beautiful crimson-breasted shrike. Um, they're pretty common, and pretty noisy. Um, and those that don't know the Zarkel Drift Road, it really is a classic birding site um, for South African birders. And um, it, it really is a, a hot spot of activity at this time of year, well, late, um, sort of late March, mid to late March. Um, the road, um, I'll try to use my mouse and see if that works. The road starts at this um, rather um, dodgy little town of Pinos Rafir. Um, Norch was very unhappy that they didn't um, sell us craft beer in the, the bottle store. Um, and the road travels um, in a, a west, uh, east to west direction. Um, and it, it goes along the course of um, the Pinos Rafir. And it ultimately ends up, um, there's a bridge over here, over, over the river. And this whole area here becomes uh, flooded when, when rains are good. So this photograph, this Google map photograph was obviously taken in a dry period. There's, there's not a lot of uh, water that can be seen, but this entire area here, well, not over here, this is a little village called Homo Homo, um, but this floodplain over here was, when we got there, it had subsided quite a bit, but when the rains came down with Eloise, this whole area was underwater. And all of these little, um, uh, labels that I put in were, were hot spots of birds that were being seen by Gauteng birders and, and these two little flags over here 
um, were where all the striped crake action was. So those that um, follow Trevor's reports um, will know that striped crake was um, a bird that people were seeing. Um, we we passed the spot a couple of times. There were five or six cars there every time we went by. Um, it's uh, it's a game of uh, patience. You've got to sit in your car and you've got to wait for the grass to move, and then you've got to hope like hell that it uh, crosses the road or it pops its head out. And uh, we just didn't um, have the time to to spend um, on a on a what is an absolutely unbelievably great bird, but we had so many other things that we wanted to see that we didn't make too much effort with that particular twitch. Um, we stayed um, at the Zarkeldorf Bird Sanctuary and Lodge, which uh, requires you to cross the river um, on a, a road called Crake Road, which is famous for all sorts of crakes, mostly um, African crakes are seen there. And it, it really is a, a wonderful place to stay and gives you uh, access to the most amazing birding. So these are just a few photographs to show you a little bit what the of what the habitat looks like. This was where the striped crake had been seen in that kind of habitat, this um, flooded grassland, and you really got to sit there and be patient. And um, this is the Homo Homo floodplain, and, and you can see there was not that much water there when we were there, but um, it, it still had little pools with some uh, reeds fringed and, and lily covered ponds, which were great for, for some very good birds. This is the bridge over the floodplain and a typical site was um, all the cattle moving across the bridge while um, taxis were racing by, um, but really good birding, lots of blue cheeked bee eaters sitting on the wires um, next to the road. And this was our sundowners at uh, a spot uh, on Crake Road actually, as you cross the floodplain. And uh, we saw a nice marsh owl here and these um, these grassy areas were full of orange-breasted uh, waxbills, which is usually a very tough bird. We, we saw plenty of them. And then just some of the birds, um, burnt nectar anomalies are classic um, uh, thornfelt bird, and they were always very vocal and showy. Uh, Black-chested prunia was the most common um, sort of uh, warbler type bird. We saw plenty of them, more so than tawny flank prunia, which is unusual. And then uh, a really nice photo of, uh, well, a really nice view of a red bulldog specker sitting on a on a donkey. And then lesser gray shrike is a bird that we obviously don't see in, in, in Cape Town or in its surrounds. Um, there are a few records, but there were plenty of them and they're obviously Paleoarctic migrants. They, they come from Europe into, into Southern Africa in, in our summer. And uh, they're enormously tricky to photograph. They are quite um, uh, shy birds. And every time you stop the car next to them, they fly away. Um, and this one just sat on this uh, beautiful thorny stem and I got really nice and close to it. And uh, what you don't often see with these lesser gray shrikes is this beautiful um, sort of peach color on its flanks. Um, and it really gave a, I, I must have taken 300 photos of that single bird because it just was such a great opportunity. And then Mariko flycatchers are common and blue waxwalls obviously are very common in those thorn felt areas. And then this was one of the highlights for us. Um, we, we went to a little reed and, and lily covered pond um, and a bird we, we really were desperate to see was uh, a black winged pratincol. And we were scanning for um, some lesser moorhens in this lily covered pond. And I, 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 I scanned the, the um, scope um, onto some dry or well, some short grassland. And um, I found a black winged pratincol in my, my scope view. And I called everyone over and I said, guys, black winged pratincol, this is what we've been looking for. And then um, it didn't take long for us to realize that there were literally hundreds of them. So these are just a few of the, the shots of the birds in flight over the grassland. And as, as abundant as they were on that grassland, they are birds that are in desperate trouble um, because of habitat loss. So um, they really are declining and um, any sightings of black wing practical are, are really special. And I'd never really photographed them before with any degree of success. So it was really nice to get a few of them as they flew overhead. Um, they really are spectacular looking birds. This, this one is um, in, in breeding plumage. You can see the, the it has this noticeable um, sort of black collar um, and the red to the base of the bull. And you can quite easily see it's a black wing pratting call. It has these um, black secondaries as opposed to the, the rufous secondaries that collared pratting call has. Um, plus, you won't get uh, collared pratting call um, in that particular area. All right, so that was um, pretty much the, the floodplains and, and uh, thorn felt of the Zarkel Drift Road. And um, it, it is, for those that haven't been to Zarkel Drift, you, you really want to time it so you go in late um, summer. Um, I, I know there are a lot of guides that do specific warbler trips there. And as I said, we, we battled with the warblers. We saw a few. Um, but the overall birding there is is absolutely phenomenal. In in a morning, 
I think we recorded on the one morning. Um, we had a full morning there and we got to about 150 species just in a morning. So you're getting a, a real combination of all the wetland stuff. Um, you're getting the sort of thornfelt stuff. There's a lot of grassland birds. Um, it, it just is um, full of uh, riverine stuff as well. So it's just a great place to go birding. I think if you did a trip there when the conditions weren't or aren't quite as good, um, it still is very good. You get a lot of those uh, thornfelt specials. Um, but it's uh, it's really best done when when there's been a lot of rain and it's late summer before the migrants depart and they're all pretty vocal and active. So then we uh, moved north to the Nell River floodplain. Um, so we visited, I mean, the, the, the road takes you from Zarkel Drift up the N1 and then you do a weird little loop to get to the place we stayed, which was a, a, a wonderful lodge called Dinanyani um, Lodge. And that has the great advantage of being less than a kilometer from the main gate of the Nels Frey um, Reserve. So Dinanyani is about over here. And on the one morning, um, Dean and I just uh, strolled down the road and then you enter the gate over here and then you have access to the park. So what's quite um, useful to know, um, just some um, sort of habitat shots. This is the lodge. This is birding in the actual reserve and there's this wonderful tower um, just outside the main campsite over here, which has probably got the scariest set of uh, steps up a ladder um, that you've ever seen. I don't know if anyone in the audience has been up that ladder, but um, uh, between Lombie and I, we were definitely quivering as we walked up the ladder. Um, and um, we didn't have too many bears when we got there for sundowners because it was quite hairy going back down. So um, it gives you a wonderful vista over the whole park. Um, but the thing about the park and this um, Google Earth uh, Google map image is obviously taken um, when the river is not in flood, but um, the, there are two discrete areas to the park that you want to focus on. This is um, the, the the very famous Fuchelfontein, which is essentially a set of, I, I guess, um, uh, pans or dams or, or, or settling ponds. I'm not sure exactly how to describe it. There's there's a, a few berm walls that separate different sections of, of the floodplain. Um, and you can walk along these berms, and I'll show you a photo now, where you can um, get amazing views of, of all the activity going around you. It's very open. There's one little island of uh, thornfelt or thorn trees, um, which is where the hide is positioned, and you get some nice um, thornfelt birds there as well. Um, but the highlight there is just to look at um, all the activity and all the birds that fly past. Um, and then the other area is this Chicana hide. It's where the, the floodplain gets a little bit narrower, um, and it has also got a wonderful hide over a, a beautiful little pan, which I, I guess is only uh, has water in, in, in high rainfall seasons, but it also has these um, woodland areas that are a little bit south and you take a walk across the floodplain and into these um, thornfelt areas where you get um, all the thornfelt birds. So um, very diverse and, and, and two very different areas which are, are absolutely vital to visit. So this is uh, Fuchelfontein and the, the bird we saw a lot of was Lesser Mohen. They, um, we saw um, quite a few with uh, little chicks. Um, and they really are um, uh, abundant. Um, we were disappointed not to see Alan's gallinule. They, they definitely would be around, but we felt we were maybe a little bit late um, in their breeding cycle. But this is what I was talking about. It's these um, berms that um, separate these ponds and you, you can walk along these berms and just scan all the different areas. And we had a wonderful thunderstorm just before we arrived, which um, added to the, the whole scenery. Um, Little Bitten is uh, a bird that we saw once and uh, obviously not an uncommon bird but quite tricky to see um, and then squawk coherence were literally everywhere and this one flew past the hide um, as we were sitting in it and I managed to capture it as it was passed um, but just wetland birds um, are, are abundant there herons egrets ducks geese um, all the rallids um, we saw an African crake um, perching its head above um, one of the berms which was quite fortuitous um, but yeah a good place to visit and then the, the Jakarna hide um, is a bit more variable. There's reed beds and some thorn felt. And this was really the star of the show, um, these little orange-breasted waxbills, which were, um, I can only say, abundant, um, which is an unusual thing for orange-breasted waxbills because they really are tricky birds um, most of the time. Um, so we had, uh, once again, some greater striped swallows, which were very um, obliging. And then um, these orange-breasted waxbills just um, all around us, which was a great opportunity to get some photographs of them because they're not easy. And then in the thorn felt, you get things like Bennett's woodpecker um, and these Levalence cuckoos. Um, we had quite an interesting experience with these Levalence cuckoos in that um, there were at least three, if not four birds, um, 
in the, the, the fringes of the Thornfelt and they were unbelievably excited. And uh, um, if you're not aware of their call, um, they are very loud and um, I guess uh, quite offensive. They, they, well, not offensive, their calls are, are extremely loud. And we had these three or four birds flying around. They were obviously upset about something. Um, and I followed them around for, for quite a while, waiting to get a, a decent photographic opportunity. Um, and that's the problem with being a photographer is you often miss things because other people are looking at birds while I'm trying to get photographs. Um, but there just is a wealth of, of bird life there. And um, we, we had plenty of things to see. So then we, we moved from Nell's Flay. Um, and um, you know, Dinanyani Lodge was, was um, incredibly good. And um, they were very delighted to have um, visitors after COVID. I think all these places are, are really battling or have battled during COVID and they're falling over themselves to, to make your stay pleasant. So if you're in that area, it's definitely the place to stay because it's so close to the reserve. Um, and uh, you know, they, they made us um, a wonderful bride. The, the, the husband who, who runs, well, his wife runs the place and the husband um, uh, stands and bras for you in the evenings and um, through the course of the evening the number of uh, brand brandy and cokes that were consumed was quite something so by the end of the evening it was quite interesting but a, a really nice place to stay. So Polokwane Nature Reserve is um, quite uh, run down now um, which is disappointing. I got really um, good gen from a local bird at, uh, bird at Joe Grossel. Um, Joe is uh, definitely one of our country's uh, best birders. Um, he is a a phenomenal birder. He's got um, such good ears and, and he's extremely knowledgeable. And uh, when I was going to Polokwane, I gave him a shot and I said, um, would he mind giving us some gen for Polokwane Game Reserve? So the Game Reserve is, is um, slightly southeast of, of the main city. Um, we stayed at um, the Merritt Hotel Ranch, which was um, also an interesting place to stay. Really good bird life around the ranch, um, but there were two weddings going on while we were there. So it was quite a noisy evening, but, uh, but quite nice and accessible to Polokwane Nature Reserve. So if someone's trying to get into the room, I'm just wondering what they want. Um, so um, that was, um, we were there th on the day of my birthday and my mates uh, very kindly gave me a, a bottle of single malt whiskey. So we enjoyed it as we watched the sunset over the reserve. Um, yeah, you can see by the sign, the reserve is, is really um, starting to, to get a bit run down. Um, although th that doesn't change the birding and in some respects it actually makes it a little bit better. The bush um, gets a little bit overgrown over the roads and that provides some good habitat for, for birds. Um, and this is just my bird lesser map of um, the, the spots that we went to. So these, these are the areas near the entrance gate. There's some very nice thorn felt here. There's some nice grassland over here. And this was the area that we focused on because this is where we were specifically looking for um, the particular endemic that we were looking for. And so most people will know that um, the Polokwane Game Reserve is most famous from a birding perspective for short clawed lark, which is um, a Southern African endemic. And this is the um, SABAP2 uh, map that shows you, this is literally the global population of the bird. So it has two discrete populations, one centered around sort of the Northwest province around um, Gaborone um, and um, the sort of uh, border between South Africa and Botswana. And then the other concentrated area is around Polokwane in the sort of grasslands with uh, scattered acacia trees. So that's the habitat that they love. You've got to find nice open grassland with the occasional um, acacia tree. And what you can see in this photo, so I'm going back a bit, that's kind of what you're looking for. You're looking for these um, isolated trees amongst the grassland. So um, we battled on the first evening, we couldn't find one. Um, and then on the second day, the, the morning we were there, we, we had um, at least four or five birds still displaying, even though it was very late in the season. And um, this particular one um, allowed me to get just close enough to get a decent photograph. They, they were extremely skittish, um, but um, the great thing about the nature reserve there is you can walk around, you don't have to worry about the big five. Um, so I was able to get uh, a little closer than you'd get from a car. And then this was probably my moment of the trip. Um, uh, we had been on our way to um, Dinonyani on our um, way to, to spend the night there to, to go to Nails Flay. And we were driving on the dirt road that accesses it, accesses it, accesses it. And um, there were two Koki Franklin standing in the road um, and standing dead still as they often do. And I screeched the car to a halt. I was driving at the time. Lombie had given me just half an hour or so to, to drive. Um, and um, 
my camera was in the back seat of the car and for everyone in the car except for me it was a lifer so there was this frantic moment where I was demanding my camera and uh, everyone was trying to get a view of the birds before they disappeared into the grass grabbed my camera um, put it on the um, windowsill um, just got the bird in focus and as I was about to click the shutter um, the male and female Koki Franklins disappeared into the long grass and never to be seen again and um, I think I acknowledged at the time that it probably ruined my entire day um, and so there was great disappointment when I missed my life a photo of a Koki Franklin it's only a bird I've seen on two previous occasions um, and then we were done with the short clawed lark and heading our way back towards the main gate to to leave and um, there was suddenly, as we turned onto a very um, nice dirt road, um, there was a male and female Koki Franklin standing right in the middle of the road. And I had thoughts that the exact same thing was going to happen to me as I fumbled for my camera. Um, I managed to get my camera and I got it onto um, the windowsill and I must have taken um, 300 photos of this pair of Koki Franklins. And um, they're wonderful birds. They're generally um, quite skittish. Um, but for some reason, this pair seemed to be attracted to our car. And as I was photographing, it just got closer and closer and closer. So this was uh, about five minutes after that experience. And I was a very happy chappy. And these were some of the photos that uh, male Koki Franklin with that sort of coffee colored head and that uh, chest barring is just a, a wonderful looking bird. Um, and then this is the, the male as it walked towards the car in this wonderful little um, uh, section of road where it was uh, quite soft sand. Um, and it's just, it, it was uh, um, a photo I never thought I'd get a chance to take with it so close to, to the car. And then um, there's a, a view of the male and the female. So the female is, is obviously um, slightly different in color. Um, it has a, this one didn't have a very well marked head. The female sometimes does have quite a defined um, set of um, lines on its head. This one was a little bit diffuse. Um, so a real highlight for me was um, finally getting a, a life of photograph of Koki Franklin. Um, incidentally, we heard them all over the place. They're pretty common. Um, they just are not that easy to see. And, and most of the Franklins, we heard um, Orange River, we heard Shelley's, um, Red Wing Franklin. Um, we saw none of those three, although we heard them. Um, and it's obviously the spur files that are generally a lot more showy. So Swainson's and, uh, and, and Natal Franklin, we, we saw quite a lot of, but uh, certainly none of the, the other more difficult Franklins. And then just a few more shots. This is a ground scraper thrush at uh, one of the, the campsites at um, Polokwane Game Reserve, and then the wonderful endemic white-throated robin chat, which um, is such a good mimic. And this one was mimicking a white-bellied sunbird um, with uh, great aplomb. Um, so a really nice opportunity to take a photograph of, of this bird, which was a lifer for, for my three mates. Um, and then Ashley Tit um, is also a really nice bird of that thorn felt, um, not, so easy, not so easy to find. Sorry, someone is just unmuted. I'm just getting feedback and whoever's unmuted, just mute themselves. That's I think um, it's it's actually my mother. So, um, Priscilla, are you able to just mute? Okay, that's better. Sorry, I was getting some terrible feedback there. And um, then obviously that's the European bee eater. Um, let me just get back to the presentation. All right, so we left Polokwane Game Reserve after um, getting some wonderful birds there. And then we headed um, for something completely different and not far from um, the, the very dry and hot and um, thorn felt covered grasslands of Polokwane. Um, you get down to uh, Machubus Kloof, which is an area of um, Afromontane forest, um, and then down to Zanin. And essentially, it's a very short drive. Um, and a lot of birding big day teams, I know Joe Grossel's team um, regularly gets over 300 species on birding big day because they go from 
this um, Thornfelt area and they, they head down the road and they go down the pass um, and they get wonderful forest birds um, and then down into Zanin where they get the, the subtropical stuff. So just the variety, this is obviously, this area is not a great um, area for birding. This is um, a very, very heavily populated area. This Mariah is where um, the, the, the Zion church is and um, you definitely don't want to be doing this road over the Easter holidays because it really is a, a very difficult place to get through. Um, and I think it was one of the prime concerns um, around COVID over the last weekend, um, because there are literally millions of people that go as a pilgrimage to Mariah in, in order to, to pray. So we fortunately weren't there um, over that uh, period, but um, this section is, is pretty dull for birding. But around Hainitzburg, which is a quaint little town, a bit like reminds me of a bit uh, of Dahlstrom, that kind of uh, quaint town, which has been um, zhuzhed up quite a little bit. And there's lots of wonderful coffee shops and restaurants. Um, and this this road that goes down um, to, I think it's called George Dam or something like that. That's a, a pretty good birding road. And then you did go down the pass to Machubus Kloof over here. And this pass over here is, is essentially next to Woodbush Forest Preserve, which is where all the great forest birding is. So this is um, Hennetsburg and we stopped at uh, Stella's um, coffee shop. Um, and I'm pleased to say, and you can see um, Norch is uh, tucking into one of his coffees there. Um, it met with his approval and we um, celebrated um, a birthday with a, a chocolate cake, which we managed to finish between the four of us. But if you're going down to um, Machubus Kloof stop in Hennesburg at Stella's, it's right next to the road. The service is great and the cakes are delicious. So um, we made a snap decision um, when we were driving down the road to get to Bramasol, which is the place we stayed, we consider doing some forest burning in the afternoon, but forest burning in the afternoon is, is pretty disappointing generally. Um, so we decided to try for two specific species and um, they further down the pass down in the subtropical areas of, of uh, Zanin. So um, this is the first one we tried for and we um, asked David Letswalo who guided us on, on the next morning in the forest, we asked him for some gen for this particular species. And I'm sure there are lots of people that are attending this talk that actually know um, what bird I'm talking to, but David was, was great. He gave these, uh, the voice note of uh, directions and he said, you drive into the plantation and then you park your car and then you count the trees. It was the third gum tree um, as you go down and it was sitting on a branch. He was there that morning and would be sitting on a branch in that gum tree. And lo and behold, um, it was sitting on a branch on the third gum tree. So this is the very well-known Agatha forest or Agatha plantation bat hawk. There's a pair that nests there and they seem to be completely unconcerned. There were, there were loggers felling trees um, quite close by. Um, and these, these birds um, just stay there and they, they've bred for many, many years. I saw my life a bat hawk at this particular spot probably 20 years ago with my father. Um, and um, that's a terrible photo of a bat hawk and I'm going to be a little indulgent and I'm going to just post that particular photo which was taken in a completely different place but it gives you a much better idea of um, the, the size of these birds eyes as nocturnal well, um, crepuscular hunters and that'll be a quiz question probably or it has already been a quiz question at the Cape Bird Club meetings um, but yeah they've got these enormous eyes so that they can hunt um, bats and swifts um, over rivers um, at dusk and dawn so um, I've seen that um, actually happening in Uganda and it really is a phenomenal sight watching these birds hunt. So that was the, the first bird ticked off. And then the second bird we needed was, was something a lot smaller um, and it's become a well-known sight. And David once again gave us some directions to um, this little weird um, housing estate. Um, and the, the bird life there was just so different to everything we'd seen for the rest of the trip. We had these wonderful African or, or Holub's um, golden weavers. Um, with these very heavy dark bills um, and red faced sticula is a bird um, really of, of uh, lush um, tropical or subtropical habitats. Um, so it was a great bird to see on this trip. Um, but those are the birds that we weren't necessarily looking for, but we managed to find incidentally. Um, that was the bird that we were looking for. Um, and um, fortunately, I was able to get a little closer, um, but it's so distinctive when you see it amongst all the bronze mannequins, um, that uh, is a magpie mannequin. And this population of magpie mannequins was discovered in Zanin, um, I don't know, probably 20 years ago. And um, it's become quite a reliable site. And we were very fortunate. We found them very easily. Um, they were quite noticeable. They've got this um, very obvious 
um, dark shoulder patch and this very dark head and this massive um, conical bill. And they probably are a third or a half size bigger than a bronze mannequin. And they were seeing, we saw plenty of bronze mannequins as well, but um, nice to compare the two. So that was um, a very fortuitous um, and um, time saving exercise because we had planned to do it the next morning, which ended up being, would have been impossible because we had to get back to the airport. Um, but yeah, such a, um, a nice way to spend an afternoon that was probably going to be spent uh, wandering around um, the forests, not really seeing anything. So then we um, went to our guest house, which this is a photo of the of a website. So I will give credit to whoever the photographer is. But this is um, a place called Bramasoli, um, and it's a, a, a BirdLife South Africa um, accredited establishment, and it's owned by an architect, and they've um, built this wonderful um, guest house out of um, this huge barn-like structure, and it really is fascinating. The, the furniture and um, all the rooms are, are, are very interesting, um, and it's got this wonderful veranda. Um, and we arrived there in, in the afternoon um, after the mannequin and the bat hawk. And um, I said to Dean and uh, Lombie and Norch, I said, um, we've got to we've got to hit it. We've got to get to 300 species before we go back to Joburg, um, before heading back to Cape Town. Um, and uh, Lombie and Norch said, no, they're going to just have a hot chocolate on the veranda. Um, so we went without them. So Dean and I saw um, some really good birds, but um, we, we caught up with most of them the next morning anyway, but it, uh, it was quite nice to head out. It was a wonderful afternoon. Um, this Drakensberg Prinia was a lifer, it's an endemic, and was a lifer for, for everyone. And um, I'm prone to taking the occasional habitat shot. And most of the time you, you take a habitat shot in order to, to hide deficiencies in the photo close up. And often that's because you were too far away from the bird or you messed up the focus. Um, this one I've hidden because this poor bird had a, a very unfortunate loss of feathers on the top of its head. So it's such a great opportunity for such a cool endemic and unfortunately messed up a little bit by its weird hairdo. And then the other classic bird at Mahubas Kloof is um, this yellow streak green bull. Um, and it's a bird that's not that easy to, to see. They're quite noisy, but they're always moving in the canopy and um, very hard to get a good view. So this one popped up so nicely. And, and actually for the first time in my life, um, when I saw a yellow streak green bull, I was actually able to see these wonderful yellow streaks on, on the breast of the bird, because that's generally something that you don't see. And it's most clearly identified by this nice white eye ring, the gray cap. And they've got this um, very cool habit of flicking a wing. So they land on a tree and they move around um, foraging and then they'll flick one wing out, um, which is quite a, a distinctive feature amongst all the other birds that you see in the forest. So the next morning we um, were met by David Litswala, who, who really is the most outstanding guide and he, he, um, he does an incredible job there with, um, with taking people birding in Woodbush Forest. Um, and the Cape Parrots are the first um, item on, the, on any agenda when you're going to Woodbush Forest. You need to be there at the crack of dawn as uh, the light is coming through the trees and these birds um, fly around and make a hell of a noise. And, um, they really are one of the most special endemics that we have had there that we have. They're incre incredibly endangered. Um, there's only, I don't know, between 500 and 1,000 left, um, and um, probably one of the largest um, factors for, for their, um, their struggles is that there's a possibility that they'll be lumped back with, um, I think it's called brown-headed parrot now, or brown-necked parrot. I can never remember um, which one it is. I think it's brown-headed parrot, um, and that's the one that you get um, in northern Kruger and into Zimbabwe. So um, it would be disastrous if they lumped Cape Parrot and we'd lose an endemic and then you'd also lose all the conservation effort that goes into Cape Parrot. They do an annual Cape Parrot count. Um, so people all around the country where Cape Parrots occur, they sit on the edge of the forests and they count Cape Parrots as they fly by in order to do a census of, of how the bird is doing. I think they're doing okay. Um, they, they were highly endangered. They, they nest specifically in dead yellowwood trees. Um, so. Um, the felling of yellowwood trees is really a, a disaster for these species, and then obviously they they suffer from the the, the beak and um, the, the beak disease. Um, plus, they're they're very popular cage birds. Anyway, that's a bit of a conservation story in Cape Parrot, but we saw the Cape Parrots nice and easily, and then poor David spent the next two hours trying to eke out anything out of the forest. It was literally the quietest um, forest birding I've ever experienced. It's a wonderful forest, and you can see the habitat. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, we, there was a Barrett's warbler somewhere in this stuff, but we had absolutely no chance of seeing it. Um, and we, we missed things like orange ground thrush and black-fronted bushrike, which are two of the very special birds. Um, but you've always got to miss 
stuff in order to have a reason to go back. Um, but we did in the end see a couple of birds. Um, Lombi was, I don't know, still don't know why he was heading into the bush. I think he might've been um, going to the loo. Um, but yeah, David had had us looking at an arena trogan over here, which was quite nice. Um, and, and then we were lucky to get this um, female African emerald cuckoo. Um, and then brown scrub robin is also a, a very a cool bird of those, those forests, which was a lifer for, for all three of the others. Um, so that was pretty much um, back in the car and then back to Bramasoli to pack. And then we hit the road and drove three and a half hours back to Joburg. And that was the end of a, a very um, enjoyable, um, very bird filled um, five days. And so the final analysis, we spent five nights in five different locations and that's more or less the route that we took. It was about a thousand kilometers traveled, maybe a bit more. That was 562 Ks the one way, but lots of side, side roads as well. Um, we we purchased zero craft beers, um, so we settled for Black Label. Um, it was, uh, I think, Norch's biggest disappointment is that um, the northeastern section of our country is devoid of craft beers. Um, we recorded 300 bird species um, on the dot. Um, we actually got to 302, um, but we had to audit our list and we, we removed two species, which in itself was a disaster because we had a competition. We had to guess between each of us how many species we'd record on the trip. And that was started um, as we landed in Johannesburg. And um, I think Norch guessed um, 298, and I think Dean guessed 304. And um, we finished the trip on 302, um, got to the airport and the, the winner um, got a Nando's um, burger at the airport and um, paid for, um, very valuable prize. Um, and then two days later, when we audited the list, we had to reduce it to 300, which would have meant um, Norch was the winner, which means that Dean owes Norch a Nando's burger. Um, so I had one lifer, um, which was the short-tailed pipit in um, the, the grasslands east of Johannesburg. Um, we had a bird that flushed out of the grass and flew a nice distance to give us a view. Um, but that was the only lifer that I managed, which I think was probably one more than I expected. Um, Lombi had 21 lifers, but um, he has another list, which is called his um, Lassa lifer list which is um, every time, uh, if, for those of you familiar with bird lasser, every time you log a new bird on bird lasser, it's not um, the white text, it actually highlights it in yellow and bold. So every time Lombie would um, record a bird on bird lasser, um, he'd get this uh, yellow bird, which was not a, an official lifer, but it was what he called a lasser lifer. And we had some um, very concerning moments during the trip when he was ticking birds like Cape Canary, and they were popping up as lasser, lasser lifers, which is just an indication of how little birding he's been doing in Cape Town. And then Norch had uh, 30 lifers, and uh, Dean was the winner of that particular competition with uh, 42 lifers. So um, for guys that are in their 500s and 600s to be getting um, that number of lifers on a five-day trip, it just shows the, the wealth of birding that you, you get in those areas. Um, and so um, I guess one of the most important things is that we returned from our trip and um, the number of post-trip positive COVID tests was zero. Lombi sent me, or well, sent all of us a message about four days after the trip saying that he had a sore throat and a headache. And so we all went into a bit of a panic, um, but it turned out to be just a, a head cold. Um, and so um, we were very grateful to be able to travel on a plane um, and uh, get through the trip without um, any, any COVID worries. So that brings me to the end of the talk. I think I've been going for, just under an hour. Uh, some of my experiences at the last minute. Um, uh, so thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to take um, any questions or comments um, or you're welcome to things through to me. I can actually look at the chat room and see if there are any. Um, all right, camera equipment did I use? Um, I have a, a Canon um, 1D, um, 1DX Mark II. Um, and I have a 500 um, F4 lens, um, which is um, half the reason why I missed that one Koki Franklin photograph, because um, it's quite a cumbersome ca camera to get from the back seat into the front seat, particularly when your colleagues or your friends are more intent on looking at the bird, which is exactly the right thing to do. Um, yeah, so that's um, pretty much the, the equipment that I use. I, I, I don't uh, use a flash or a tripod. I don't like using a flash. Um, I think it makes things look a little unnatural. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the um, positive comments. I, I'm happy to to take any more questions. I'll give uh, a minute or two, 
um, and then hand back over to, to Priscilla. Um, but feel free to, to pop a message to me um, if you want to ask any questions about any of the details of the trips to, to get some idea of where to go. I've um, got plenty of pins that I'm willing to share, um, so you feel free to do so. Right, thanks very much, everybody. Priscilla, over to you. Uh, Mike, I think I think it's over to me. Over to oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, uh, no thank problem. You. Um, Mike, uh, Priscilla outlined why uh, you, you know, you're such a go-to speaker for for talks and presentations. Um, you always bring uh, a lot of interesting anecdotes, uh, quite apart from the birding knowledge, uh, the photography, and the enthusiasm which comes with it. And um, it also brought back uh, many pleasant memories from. Uh, birding in uh, that sort of northern Gauteng, southern Lipopo, Limpopo area. Um, and it's reassuring for me to know that I'm not the only one who struggles with those warblers. <laughs> <They're laughs> I can terrible. remember many, many, many hours spent uh, looking for them. Um, but also a very special uh, word of thanks because um, you did step into the breach at short notice. Uh, so thank you very much for that and for a, a, a most uh, enjoyable, entertaining talk. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Johan, and um, thank you uh, very much to, to everyone for listening.